Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's good to start the day off while everyone's still awake before lunch. I'm not in the way or anything like that. Uh, and, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I, I don't get up north uh, enough outside the city, but uh, this is a great excuse and I look forward to coming back uh, to visit and tour uh, again soon. I wanted to start by talking a little bit about where we are uh, as a state, as a healthcare delivery system, as a country, and then try to weave in some themes around clinical research and where I think uh, we're headed uh, in terms of funding, in terms of opportunities. Uh, and, and by my very nature, I have to be an optimist uh, to be in state government today, to be in any government today. Uh, but I do think that despite historic lows and uh, tighter funding lines, what is it, 4% now or something, um, there is still good reasons to be in research. You know, we have today in the United States a $2.7 trillion health care delivery system, $2.7 trillion annually. And it's growing. It's growing fast. It's 18% of our GDP today. It's uh, still going to go up before it slows down and stops in terms of a, a percent of our economy. And we know that a third of that $2.7 trillion is wasted. Imagine the opportunities, the possibilities of just taking a little bit of that money that's wasted in healthcare and putting it toward research. Well, I think that's going to happen very quickly. We know that with translational research, we will have many of the answers that our healthcare delivery system needs. We know that today, while it's fee-for-service run amok, while it's people get on the hamster wheel of care and then they end up at the end of life on 17 medications in the intensive care units for three months with a peg tube and a, every other tube coming out of them, that's not what we want. We don't want more health care. We want more health. And the answers to getting more health will come from research. Whether it's T0 through T4, I've seen so many different kinds of ways of looking at translational research from preclinical to clinical, bench to bedside, back to the bench again. We know that unless we, as researchers, as scientists, as investigators, start to focus on the healthcare delivery system and what ails it, um, that 18% is going to keep going higher. It, it was back in 1998 that a study showed it took 17 years for research to get to the bedside, to get to actual practice, widespread dissemination. A recent study done, you know, that's from when you first think of the idea, you get funded, you get published, it gets in the academic journals, it eventually makes it to the textbooks, it eventually gets to the CME dinner talks. <laughs> Doctors finally start using that stuff. 17 years. Well, we know now that a recent study showed it's still almost two decades before patients start to see the benefits of all of our work. And that <coughs> delay is unacceptable. We have to start thinking outside of our labs and say, how do we make what we know we're doing that is so important help everyone, help Americans today? New York is very lucky. We have seven of the 62 federally funded CTSAs across the country. And so we have a special role in biomedical research we have been a primary site on many levels for translational research from bench to bedside. And the NIH vision has always been to spur innovation through the CTSAs, to build the private and the public sectors together and spin off discoveries that attract investment and create jobs. And the ultimate goal has been to change the focus and accelerate the shift away from just treating disease, which is absolutely important, to either curing it or preventing it in the first place. I uh, heard a statistic. Every new case of HIV today in the United States adds an estimated $397,000 of lifetime medical costs. And that's not going to go down. Because those drugs, as they go generic, there will be new drugs that are expensive once again to fill the void. 
that are combinations or whatever. So we know a $400,000 bill versus preventing that one case, or now we're starting to hear curing it. What a difference that can make. So what would I pay to prevent one case of age, HIV? $396,000. <laughs> Not really, but that's, that's the opportunity. The opportunity is on the prevention and the cure side. Not to mention that treatment will continue to accelerate, and we have to focus on that. But there are two big opportunities there. And as we get to clinically integrated delivery systems, as we as a healthcare delivery system are on the hook for the total cost of care, saying you're going to get $200 per patient per month no matter what happens to that patient, suddenly research's stock is going to go up. Your stock is going to go up if you're helping to prevent that one case of whatever it is, or to cure that one case of whatever it is. So the department has been working very hard to try to advance this in the state. Obviously, the ECRIP program is one example of a, a very good partnership between the academic medical centers and researchers and the health department, where we uh, invest about $17 million a year, invest in uh, younger investigators to be the next generation of scientists despite the funding lines, despite all the challenges, at the, which is cyclical at the federal level. Um, we're investing in our next generation. And, and we're hoping that you continue to help strengthen the program, help us actually invest more. Why is it only 17 million? Why shouldn't there be an extra zero after that? Well, it's up to you to go lobby and, and make that happen. It should happen. We know what the ROI is on research and the high quality jobs and the other jobs it creates. And there is one word everywhere in politics today. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. And research is the, the kind of jobs we want. You want to revitalize the upstate economy? It's jobs. It's high quality research jobs. And, and we forget as scientists our important role to guide policymakers in what kind of jobs we want. Do we want more casino jobs or do we want more research jobs? Well, probably both, but you know, you decide. So our vision is with ECRIP and other programs to advance the role of research in the state of New York. And one of the big opportunities is with our Medicaid program. You know, our Medicaid program was a $54 billion a year program when we started two and a half years ago, growing at 13% a year, a year. That means less money for education, less money for everything else in our budget. 40% of healthcare costs in the state of New York were Medicaid. <coughs> it grew annually. Medicaid's budget grew 13%, which meant that Education stayed the same, and everything else actually went down that amount. Investments in roads, investments in everything else. A third of the state's budget was Medicaid. And what were we getting for that? New York was ranked 22nd in the country for quality, ranked last for hospital admissions, readmissions, and last on many other quality indicators. We went on the road. We got about 4,000 ideas on how to fix Medicaid. We instituted uh, about 78 of them. And within a year, we had saved $4.6 billion. <laughs> we are on track to save $34 billion over five years in our state's Medicaid program. And it wasn't rocket science. It was actually pretty simple stuff. Why don't we increase the generic substitution rate? Well, that's $425 million of savings a year. Why don't we institute a transportation coordinator in Brooklyn, where the Russian mafia used to run the ambulance services? That's hundreds of millions of dollars of savings and death threats to my staff, but real savings and real death threats um, to our staff. It's about making, breaking down those silos that we all know. The hospital doesn't talk to the nursing home, doesn't talk to the primary care office, doesn't talk to the school-based health center. Well, you've done a lot to break down those silos, and you are actually good models of what we should be aiming toward, strengthening primary care, strengthening the connections between the different silos. 
And a lot of these ideas were also based on effectiveness research, comparative effectiveness research, and other research done over time. We said, let's just start paying. Medicaid should invest in all United States Preventative Service Task Force grade A or B recommendations. Believe it or not, two years ago, we, we weren't doing that. Evidence-based prevention, we weren't doing that. We said, we will cover all of that. We will cover podiatry services for diabetics. Hmm, that makes sense. Maybe they won't get an amputation. We will cover lactation counseling for moms. Pediatric obesity goes away. A lot of other problems go away. We will stop paying for those knee arthroscopies, for osteoarthritis, human growth hormone, for kids with idiopathic short stature syndrome, basically short kids who would have ended up five foot five get growth hormone shots, so they get to be five foot seven. And who did that? A lot of docs. Idiopathic, let's give them several tens of thousands of dollars. Medicaid would pay for that. Stop, it's not evidence-based. Let's also cut lumbar discography, and implantable infusion pumps for pain, for non-cancer pain, functional electronic, uh, electrical simulation, and on and on and on. There's such a list of things that we are paying for as a society that makes no sense. But now we have the evidence to back it up and say, we can't afford to pay for this. Instead, we should pay for something else. You know, a few years ago, two years ago when we started, fully 23% of electively done percutaneous coronary interventions, you know where they put a balloon and stent in you, fully 23% were inappropriate according to national guidelines. ACA, HA uh, said, no, you shouldn't. It's a 20% blockage. You don't need to balloon it and stent it. And yet, at $14,000 a pop, lots of cardiologists did it. So we just said, here's your data at the hospital level and at the provider level on how many inappropriate procedures you're doing. Evidence-based. I, I, I threaten to withhold payment. We haven't withheld a single dollar yet because it takes a long time to withhold money. But today that rate has gone from 23% inappropriate to 8% inappropriate. Millions of dollars of savings. It's the right thing to do. I said, go fill your cath labs with underserved minorities who actually need it rather than the people who don't need it. There's so many more opportunities like that. We put a million dollars, one million dollars, into pressure ulcers, understanding and defining so that the hospital and the nursing home uses the same grading system for pressure ulcers, right? Believe it or not, they had different systems. Oh, and EMS. Now they all call it the same thing. We've saved $28 million, not to mention thousands of people who no longer have bed sores because we're just using the same language, the same terminology. So it's, it's almost sad to see how much needs to be done at the delivery side. These little things that make such a difference for people and for society and for affordability of healthcare that we haven't done because researchers, eh, that's soft science, that's easy. We don't need to do that. I like to spend my time on the things that matter. Well, yes, you do and we want you to. But there's a lot out there that matters that's outside the traditional CTSA roles on the ben bedside side, on the delivery system side, and we desperately need your help. We desperately need your help. We're, we're poised for leadership. We are. In, with the PCORI program, with the Patient-Centered uh, Outcomes Research Institute and our CDRN, the 22 organizations across seven systems, sharing data. It's about patient-centered care, patient-centered clinical research. Over two and a half million patients will be enrolled initially, up to six million patients ultimately. Um, building on the six existing CTSAs in New York City with lots of very good data and, and incredible leadership. That's one example of us doing everything right together in New York. I am very optimistic that if we can do one or two more of those, 
that we are going to be far ahead of the rest of the country. We won't be like Vanderbilt shutting down or, or other places that are just imploding. It's this team science that we need to do. I'm sorry if anyone's from Vanderbilt. <laughs> What are some of the big drivers of costs and the opportunities for you? Certainly the fee-for-service versus managed care change, ending fee-for-service, moving everything into managed care, understanding total cost of care, creating accountable care organizations so that we're actually accountable <laughs> to our patients for outcomes and, and partnering across the ecosystem. A medical malpractice is a big problem. In New York State, we spend $677 million annually in payouts, more than twice the next state in the country, which is Pennsylvania, where they have really high uh, awards as well. It's just wasted, wasted money. I mean, obviously there's safety issues, but not that much money should be going out of the system to lawyers because no one's doing, you know, no one's doing the research. It's not, it's not sexy. It's lawsuits. 677 million. Now you you could get 676 million in, in research funds if you could lower it, right? Not really, but we we, we have opportunities. You know, diabetes is a great example. We spend 8.7 billion dollars in direct costs a year in diabetes in the state of New York. That obesity epidemic, it's real. Today more people die in the world of problems related to overnutrition than undernutrition. That's including Africa and everywhere else. Yeah, it's interesting, it's important. Maybe we can prevent it, but it's hard to prevent. We need to figure that out. It, 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 the, the prevention agenda is, is, is something that we should all know and start to think about. What we all want is health, and the only way to keep health is to prevent disease in the first place. <coughs> we have to reduce. We know that if we can reduce blood pressure by 5%, that'll save us $5 billion in healthcare costs. These are billions we're talking. We know that dementia, the silver tsunami of aging elders and d dementia is gonna overtake us. We know that even today, smoking <laughs> is the biggest scourge. One in five New Yorkers still smoke. We know that today, two-thirds of cancer is caused by our choices. One-third is by tobacco, which is our choice to smoke or not, or maybe it's not a choice. One-third by obesity, inactivity, and other choices. Two-thirds of cancer is caused by our choices. Yes, we can blame our parents and our genes and all, but a lot of it is outside our traditional purview of research. It's in that social determinants of health space. It's in stuff that we don't think about in health care. It's in poverty. It's in lack of education. It's in the food deserts that we live in. It's in the lack of ho stable housing. We, as scientists, need to understand those social determinants of health. It's incumbent on us. A wise professor told me to trudge down the corridors of indifference. There's a lot of indifference in that space. <laughs> Someone, uh, the Trust for America's Health came out with a number that if you just put $10 per person per year into prevention, you would save $20. <laughs> Double the ROI, the return on investment. You don't get that return on Wall Street. You know, in support of housing is another example, right? A lot of homeless people, a lot of people stuck in nursing homes because there's nowhere else for them to go. If you put up today the numbers, today Medicaid pays $755 a day for an inpatient stay. We spend about $455 a day for inpatient psychiatry, about $300 a day for a nursing home bed a day. Uh, we spend about $129 a day for jail as a society. We spend $68 a day for a homeless shelter. And we could spend just $47 a day for supportive housing. Housing is health care. 
you put up a housing units and you put in a substance abuse counselor in the basement, a social worker maybe, maybe some mental health uh, treatment uh, in, in the area. It costs less, it's the right thing to do. <coughs> We're making hundreds of millions of dollars of state investment in it. Feds are not interested. Feds are at CMS are like, oh, we don't, we don't invest in housing. We don't invest in capital like that. We don't invest it. Meanwhile, they're paying for nursing homes, which are the biggest investment in housing of elderly and, and anywhere else. Uh, they're not willing to invest in something cheaper and better and more appropriate and, frankly, the right thing to do. We're really now starting to focus and understand outcomes like we never did before. We're actually understanding, yes, it's always been about processes. You know, you try to get these patients on these medications. You try to improve the processes along the way. But we're finally getting a, a, a good window on outcomes beyond just mortality. You know, it was always easy to count dead, alive. Now we're starting to understand outcomes at a deeper level across many conditions and across many conditions together. And that has been a real opportunity in advancing the science in this space uh, in, in, in ways that we never did before. I'll give you an example. You know, in, in Medicaid, we have about 975,000 New Yorkers who have two or more chronic conditions. You know, the, the 550 problem, the 5% of patients responsible for 50% of the costs. Those patients with two or more chronic conditions are eligible for something called Medicaid health homes. This is not a place, it's not a physical place, but it's a construct about improving care delivery to these patients, about coordinating their care across the nursing home to the uh, ER, to the hospital, to primary care. So far, we've enrolled about 70,000 New Yorkers in this, and this is incredible. What are they doing with these folks? Well. When, when one of these people call 911, and they happen to be in the Maimonides network, the ambulance company instantly sends emails and SMSs to the primary medical doctor, to the emergency room where they're going, and to a care coordinator, a community health worker. The community health worker shows up in the ER before the patient's even there. You remember, most of these ER uh, visits are, are, are not serious. They're, they're ambulatory sensitive or they can be cared for outside in other settings. And this community health worker says, Mrs. Jones, you're welcome to wait here six hours until you get seen by a doctor, but I just happened to set up an appointment with your regular doctor in 15 minutes. Would you like to come across the street with me? It works. It saves money. It's the right thing to do. Those workers now are creating <coughs> parallel problem lists. So Mrs. Jones is CHF diabetes asthma, but Mrs. Jones, on top of the EHR network, electronic health record network in the Bronx or in those Rios in Brooklyn, have a parallel problem list of number one, domestic violence, number two, unstable housing, number three, number four. And that's why she keeps ending up in the hospital. It's not because of medication non-adherence. It's because she's not safe, and she needs a safe place to go. And so if we want to reduce all those health care costs, it's outside our health care delivery system. There are unlimited opportunities like that. We're creating an all-payer database that will be ready for internal Department of Health use by June of this year, oh, of next year, sorry. Mm -hmm. An all-payer claims database means whether you're Medicare, Medicaid, any of the private payers, I will be able to track to the dollar where your claims are coming from. We can get to total cost of care. We can understand Mrs. Jones cost us $200,000 last year because of 16 ER admissions that really weren't needed. And then you can do something about those 16 ER admissions. <laughs> what can you do from a research perspective if you have that? We're also creating something called the SHINee, the Statewide Health Information Network New York, connecting all the clinical EHR data across all the regional RIOs into one statewide network. You can get a peek into everyone's electronic medical record from Brooklyn to Buffalo. 
in real time. What would you do with all that phenotypic data? Maybe you'll add some genotypic data to it? It's possible. It's very possible. And we're aiming to build it so that it happens that way. Those opportunities are important for several reasons. One, obviously, is the opportunities with big data and all of that. But even the small data is important. So when we talk big data, it's, it's, it's vast processing needed. It's incredible amounts. It's the texts of all of those clinical notes. Lots of stuff there that's very valuable. But even the small data, even the metadata, as we know, can be extremely important. Knowing that Mrs. Jones goes to these four hospitals on a regular basis who never knew about each other seeing Mrs. Jones is priceless. There's a lot of opportunities there. We have a lot of issues to figure out. There are technical, there are legal, there are fiscal, there are ethical hurdles to figure out and, and ultimately get to that comprehensive personalized medicine. And I know your next speaker will be talking a little bit about that, so that will be uh, a real uh, area of work for, for young researchers in this room. But we have so much history here in the state of New York, and we have so much opportunity that, uh, you know, this is the right place to be. It is now still the time. I still tell everyone, go into academic medicine, uh, prove your chops, get a few grants, get an R01, and you can do whatever you want. Maybe get a center grant, too. <laughs> New York has a rich history of bench and bedside research. I, I want to share one of those stories. In, in, in 1926, pernicious anemia was always a deadly disease. It, pernicious anemia is a loss of red blood cells, and you, you know there was no hope for patients. Patients who had it always died. George Whipple, a researcher at the University of Rochester in 1934, was making dogs anemic and then feeding them different types of food to see which worked best. Apparently, liver worked best. And other researchers, George Richard Minot and William Murphy at Harvard and Peter Brent at the Brigham Hospital, heard about his work and wondered if this could be applied to humans. It really wasn't easy to get the gravely ill to eat a half pound of liver a day, but it worked. Those early experiments later led to the studies that showed it was a deficiency of vitamin B12 at the heart of these uh, de uh, once deadly disease. We need more of that kind of innovation. And today, we've learned that what used to be the, uh, the, the model in, in academia, in science, build a niche, own it, be the best at something super tiny, doesn't work anymore. Just have to look at the headlines to see that sharing is the next billion dollar idea. I think it was Twitter yesterday, Facebook before that, Instagram. All those billion dollar ideas, multi-billion dollar ideas, are all built on sharing, on collaborating, on teaming, on working together across traditional silos. And in science, we realize that is the same. That's the promise of the CTSAs. I wish you a very productive day. Thank you very much.